End of last year, Bluetech Research published an insight report on the hydrogen economy. Paul O'Callaghan was kind enough to share his team's work with me. Thanks, Paul. I expected it to be straightforward. The world needs to decarbonize, Hydrogen is a tool for that, and it's a convenient way to stock excess renewable energy production. So electrolysis plants will start popping up everywhere, representing a tremendous business opportunity for the water industry. You know, you'll need to feed them some water. Simple. Well, simple, but wrong. That story is much more complex and intricate. Equipped with Bluetech's report as a precious translation tool, I went down the rabbit hole. It took me five months, but here's what I learned. Hydrogen is a colorful word, and not all colors are born equal. Hydrogen is much more controversial than what I first thought, and it will never be black or white. We're back to colors, right? The hydrogen economy may rather become a nice little side business for the water industry than a tidal wave, and hydrogen may surprisingly have a good bond with wastewater treatment. So buckle up and embark with me. This journey starts in Vienna in 2018. The first time I came across the topic of hydrogen was indeed during the European Utility Week, and it started from the opening keynote. No less than five speakers mentioned it as the future of energy management in a decarbonized world. Getting ready for the future. You're looking now with hydrogen, you're looking at biomethane. Power to X, power to hydrogen. Producing hydrogen coming out of our wastewater treatment plants. Power to hydrogen is a very promising technology. Energy that will be produced from hydrogen. It continued as a red thread throughout the week, with Germany as a recurring example. The pitch was simple. Germany is strongly invested in wind farms. You can decide when the wind blows and if it blows at night, you might be producing more than you consume. As an energy layman like me, it's difficult to realize how complex electricity grid management actually is. That thing is tricky. You need the offer to match demands at any point in time. If not, the frequency of the grid starts to vary and as soon as it exceeds a variation of 0.05 Hz, power plants may start disconnecting, which worsens the problem. And soon enough, you have a blackout. So, if you're Germany, you don't want your wind farms to shut down your grid just because we're in the middle of the night. Hence, you have two options, stopping your windmills, but heavily investing in them to stop them when there's wind may sound weird, or store that energy. Oh, wonderful. So you really never listened at school. You can't store electricity, you dummy. Wait, first, how do you know I was a bad pupil? And second, you can actually store electricity, for instance, in batteries, but not only. That's the full concept of power to x Imagine you're Switzerland. You have mountains and plenty of pump electric turbine systems. Whenever there's too much electricity on the grid, you pump water up the mountains, and when you're missing electricity, you let that water come back down and produce hydroelectricity. But what if your country is not 70% made of mountains? Well, you need another solution, and that's where green hydrogen kicks in. Green is the color we attribute to hydrogen when it is produced through the electrolysis of water, using renewable energies. I warned you, hydrogen is a colorful word. So let's maybe pause here for a second and review those colors. So we have green, which is produced through electrolyzers and powered by renewable energy, as we've just seen. But we also have brown, which is gasified from coal, and gray, produced through steam methane reforming from fossil fuel. We then have blue, which is similar to gray, as it is also produced by steam methane reforming from fossil fuel, with the kick that this time you capture the carbon byproduct. There's also purple or pink, which is this time similar to green, as it features electrolysis, but uses nuclear power as an input instead of renewable. And finally, you have my personal crush, turquoise, which is produced through the pyrolysis of methane. I'll tell you in a minute what I love about that one. For now, we may see a colorful panel of hydrogens and a promising prospect with the green one. Yet, in all honesty, 98% of hydrogen produced today is produced from steam methane reforming. Alena Farger is principal at Sven Capital Partners and co-founder of the first European investment fund dedicated to renewable gases. From fossil fuel. In other words, there's only two kinds of hydrogen in the world. Paul Martin is a chemical process development expert and founder of Spitfire Research. There's the kind that you can buy, which is 98.7% derived from fossils without carbon capture. And then there's byproduct hydrogen. 1.3% is made as a byproduct of electrolysis to make chloralkali chemicals. So you see, we might have many colors to define many shades of hydrogen. Yet, if I was to represent them on a graph, it would look like that. And talking of that tiny little 98 8.7% portion of the graph, 
There's something you shall know about it. Gray is a lie, okay? Let's call a spade a shovel here. This is not gray, it's black. In fact, it's ultra black. It's black hole black. It's 30% blacker than the fossil fuel that it's made from. So long before upscaling or not, the power to X approaches, there's a lot to build in the wannabe hydrogen economy. As we know, there's a strong driver for that. If we still want to have a planet to live on in the future, we need to decarbonize. And hydrogen is always addressed as a way to do exactly that as an energy carrier that doesn't feature any carbon atom it sounds like a perfect tool to decarbonize our world yet hydrogen is not really a decarbonization strategy it's more a decarbonization problem we haven't even begun to solve and one that we, we must solve why today the world is using 120 million tons of hydrogen per year and as 98.7 percent of it is produced from fossil fuels it is in turn a carbon intensive good what are we using these 120 million tons for you love graphs don't you? One third of it is used in a mixture with other gases, for instance in methanol production or in direct reduced iron for steel. The other two thirds are direct hydrogen use, mainly into applications, oil refining and ammonia production. 75% of oil refining will disappear in a decarbonized future and the remaining 25% will keep serving the petrochemical industry. So if we do the maths, the hydrogen needs will fall to 90 million tons. But if we don't do anything, 90 million tons of hydrogen makes for a lot of carbon in that said decarbonized future. For one ton of uh, hydrogen emits almost 10 tons of CO2, this is this technique. If the hydrogen industry doesn't move away from grey hydrogen, it will be producing 900 million tons of CO2 per year. And Blutex report shows how this is even twice worse when you're using coal as a feedstock. The natural evolution would be to transition towards blue hydrogen, which would enable us to capture 60% of the CO2 with the current market standards and 90% with more advanced technologies. Which will add something between one to three euros per kilo to the hydrogen production cost, knowing that for grey hydrogen, the market price was around 1.5 to 2 euros per kilo. So when we switch from grey to blue, we double the price tag. And that's not the only issue. They always forget about the methane leakage and the methane on the 20 year time horizon has 86 times the global warming potential of CO2. Blue hydrogen is really quite blackish. Hence if blue isn't really the solution, what color shall we turn to? Well, we could switch the base material and substitute biomethane for fossil fuels. That's, for instance, the case with turquoise. Be patient, we're not yet there. Another way is electrolysis with renewable electricity, where you take water molecule, you pass a current in there, and basically the water molecule H2O will split in H2 hydrogen and O2 oxygen. Remember, that's the hydrogen I was referring to, talking of Germany's excess wind power during nights. And that's also the hydrogen we are mostly looking at as water professionals, as it requires large amounts of very clean water. Wait. How much water exactly? To make one kilogram of hydrogen, you need nine kilograms of water, nine liters of water, and the water has to be pure. So to decarbonize 90 million tons of gray hydrogen, we'll need 810 million tons of water, AKA cubic meters. If we factor in the water needs of the cooling process, that roughly multiplies the figure by 10, reaching 9,180 million cubic meters. To a certain extent, this is huge. Today, the world features an installed desalination capacity of about 36 billion cubic meters per year. So feeding the electrolyzers that shall produce this green hydrogen represents an additional 25% installed capacity. But compared to the world's projected 6,900 billion cubic meter water abstractions in 2030, this is still not that important. We are talking of 0.13% of the world's water use. Now, that's only true if we're making this green hydrogen out of renewable energy. To make 50 or 60 65 kilowatt hours of electricity by a thermal power plant it takes orders of magnitude more water than 10 kilograms. Actually, a study by Michael Weber estimates that order of magnitude at 4,200 kilogram of water per kilogram of hydrogen. That would now make for 5.5% of the world's water abstractions, which might be a crazy opportunity for the water industry, as we would now multiply by 10 the installed desalination capacity, but would long before that represent an environmental burden 
that would make it highly unsustainable. So clearly, green hydrogen has to be done from renewables. This is the way. Yet, how much of the world's capacity would that cover? So to make 90 million tons per year using the best electrolyzer in the world that you can buy, that's 50 kilowatt hours per kilogram of hydrogen. You can't afford that one, but that's okay. Let's assume you can scale those up to an enormous scale and make lots of them. That would mean that you would need 4,500 terawatt hours of electricity. In 2019, all of the wind and solar in the whole world added up to only 2100 terawatt hours. Remember how at the beginning of that quest I was looking at green hydrogen as a way to store the excess renewable production in Germany's nights? Well, it turns out that if we wanted to just decarbonize the uses of grey hydrogen, assuming wind blows 100% of the time, which is not the case, the sun shines 100% of the time, which is not the case, and these renewables only feed my green hydrogen electrolyzers, and nothing else, which still is not the case. We would still cover less than half of the needs. Hmm. Shouldn't 2022 me start to think about informing 2018 me and 2011 me that this entire hydrogen economy thing is rather something for 2040 me? This is the way. But this renewables installed capacity bottleneck may still not be the most decisive limiting factor for a green hydrogen future. As Bluetech research underlines in their Hydrogen Economy Insider report, green hydrogen costs five to seven times more than gray hydrogen. Let's count the points. On the flip side, green hydrogen is carbon neutral. But on the downside, it may be costly in water, if not done from renewables. The renewables installed base is far from being sufficient and it's expensive. End of the story. Then you double the accumulated production capacity, your price drops by a certain percentage. For wind and solar, it was around 30%. And uh, for hydrogen and different bricks, it's, uh, it's supposed to be between 10 and 17%. See, hope is back. However, we're more earnest in desiring decarbonization and renewable electricity is also getting cheaper and cheaper. Those two things have changed, but technology wise and in terms of the properties of hydrogen and its thermodynamics, nothing's changed. Hence, there's a limit as to how low the price can go. And that limit has much to do with the nature of the electrolysis process itself, which is maybe the right point in time to introduce a new character in that story. That hydrogen oxygen double bond. Jeff Ward is the CEO of Hazel Group Limited, a pioneering company undertaking the commercialization of a low emission hydrogen and graphite production process more to that when we tackle turquoise hydrogen. Not the single bond of the methane, the double bond of the water, an incredibly strong attraction, takes a lot more energy to break. But back to my question. Is that the end of the story for green hydrogen? Well, actually, not really. Whatever way we look at it, we shall move away from brown and gray hydrogen. And green is a good prospect for exactly that. And for the sake of efficiency, some areas could specialize in producing it. You need very specific conditions. You need a desert and it needs to have an ocean to the west. When that happens, we get nice access to sunlight, high capacity factor solar. And then every night as the sun's going down, the land starts to cool down and the winds blow in off the ocean. So you get this perfect pairing of sun and wind with maybe a 70% capacity factor combined between the wind and the sun. This provides you with a good potential for renewable energy, while the ocean also serves as a water source for desalination. And if we look at a world map, this is a significant opportunity for places like Western Australia, Chile or Namibia. But when it comes to the uses of green hydrogen beyond replacing grey and brown, the experts I interviewed have diverging opinions. Actually, Paul is adamant. Hydrogen is amazing. It's just a tool that needs to be used for the right purposes. And burning it as a fuel is not the right purpose for it. That's an opinion he supports with hard facts. Consider listening to the full interview. The link is in the description. Let me give you just two. Hydrogen has a low power density. For instance, methane gas has 3.2 times higher power density than hydrogen gas. So you need significantly higher volumes of hydrogen than the carrier you intend to replace if you use it as an energy source we intend to burn. Then there's the cost aspect that we already discussed and the narrow path to scale for the technology. Today, there are for instance only three hydrogen ready cars on the market. And as Bluetech underlines, companies like Scania renounced hydrogen for their trucks and decided to double down on electric vehicles instead. On the other end of the spectrum, Alina is of a totally different opinion. What is really nice about hydrogen is that you can decarbonize a lot of things with it. You can power cars, bars, Trucks, trains, planes, boats by hydrogen. There's even a section where it's already cost competitive today 
the forklift. In this green hydrogen for mobility scenario, we would focus hydrogen on the long distances that may be problematic for batteries. But that's not the only perk. If you have two technologies, you can move faster when it's only one. In the transportation sector, if you have both, you have less investment needed in reinforcing the grid and uh, you reduce the peak loads. The idea is that the last percentages from 90 to 100 percent electric vehicles involve expensive investments and grid reinforcements to cover the peaks, something hydrogen fuel cells would allow flattening out. Alina also sees further uses of hydrogen in the industry to replace some other carbon-based fuels. Again, if you want to measure yourself the extent to which Paul and Alina disagree, the link to my full interview with Alena is of course as well in the description. Now, there's a last dimension on which both agree still. The question now is what kind of support mechanism will be implemented by different states? What we need is the decarbonization policy, the carbon taxes and the emission bans that signal to people, hey, all of your choices are valid, but some choices generate a lot of fossil CO2 in the atmosphere and they're going to be very expensive choices. So you shouldn't make them unless you don't really have an alternative. So let me recap what we've seen so far. The role of hydrogen in the world's decarbonization shall start with the most pressing issue of replacing the blackish gray one with greener alternatives such as an improved blue, green or the turquoise I'm now teasing you for a while. And future will tell if the EU 470 billion euro investment expected in Bluetech's report by 2050 or spent capital's 475 million euros green gas funds can unleash a hydrogen opportunity beyond this lowest hanging fruit. But why am I teasing you this turquoise hydrogen with the delicacy of an elephant in a porcelain store? We've seen that we want to move away from blackish gray and brown. Blue might be as much of a problem as a solution Paul qualified purple as a waste of nuclear energy and green divided our experts. Yet, there's a color that might be greener than green and you would have guessed that's turquoise. Imagine you would be producing biomethane, which is by definition carbon neutral. If you then use this biogas in a pyrolysis process to form hydrogen and capture the carbon as graphite, your entire process now becomes carbon negative. Is this science fiction? Not at all. We look to build a demonstration plant. Woodman Point will be a 100 ton per annum hydrogen production facility. It'll co-produce about 375 tons of graphite. And it'll be the first fully integrated, continuously operating 24 seven example of our technology. That plant will feature the HAZER process, an acronym for hydrogen and zero emissions research. To oversimplify, Here's what the HAZER process does. You take methane, and in the case of the Woodman Pond project, biomethane, and you heat it up until it falls apart. Hydrogen atoms now recombine to form hydrogen gas, and carbon reacts with HAZER's catalyst to form 90% pure graphite. That's quite cool already, right? But wait! there's better. Woodman Point isn't actually just any industrial location, it is a wastewater treatment plant. We thought a, a very good opportunity for both the wastewater industry and the clean energy industry to collaborate. That is the lowest emission, most sustainable and most circular economy aligned way of making our application. Indeed, biomethane produced out of wastewater sludge digestion will be taken through Hazer's reactor and split to create two high value products, turquoise hydrogen and graphite. Hydrogen Hydrogen could be used in heavy vehicle transport, as per the scenario Alina covered minutes ago, or actually even closer to the point where it's produced. The city of Perth that has metals processing and other industries, a number of them use hydrogen. You know, the hazer type process could supply hydrogen into heavy industrial applications. And this would be a perfect example of the primary target we discussed, replacing one-to-one -one the ugly grey hydrogen with a greener alternative. And what better than our carbon negative turquoise hydrogen to that extent? On the other end of the process, to produce graphite could have several applications ranging from low-value options like road making or building materials up to high-end ones like battery anode materials. And in an even more circular approach... Some quite innovative things that we're looking at for our carbon is ways that we can reuse it in the water treatment industry itself as ways of you know, using its unique properties so that it can substitute for activated carbons or other forms of carbon that the water treatment industry uses. Hazer doesn't intend to limit itself to the scale of wastewater treatment plants and sees in its process a way to decarbonize natural gas on a larger scale. And this video isn't sponsored at all by Hazer, which is not alone in that market. For instance, Monolith in the US is following a similar path with apparently a bit of advance in terms of scale and industrialization of the process. But one, Monolith never answered my interview requests. 
and two, they have a bad taste to not locate their facilities on wastewater treatment plants. So of course, they can't be as cool as Hazer. Indeed, from a water industry perspective, isn't Hazer's stake at Turco's Hydrogen an exciting prospect to contribute to the energy transition, leverage synergy effects through, for instance, wastewater heat exchangers, and decarbonize the sector itself? I bet many will be closely monitoring whatever happens in Perth in the next years. So what did we learn on that journey? Maybe that, as water professionals, we shall keep an eye on the development of green and turquoise hydrogens, yet without stopping everything to focus just on that as Bluetech's report was the advisors. Maybe also that there are many sides to a single story. But above all, this entire investigation proves how central carbon topics will be in the next years, in case anyone still doubted it. It was a blast putting together this huge piece of work. I'd like to thank Bluetech's team, Paul Martin, Alena Farger, Geoff Ward, my wife filming this, my daughter for the beautiful drawings, and of course, all the ones that pointed me in the right direction along the way. If you like this kind of deep dive, you'll certainly appreciate that other one I produced on the weird idea of doing icebergs around. And to learn more about the perks, limits, and perspectives of hydrogen, remember to check out my full interviews with Paul, Alina, and Joff in the description. And after five months in the making of this deep dive, I'd be so happy if you were so kind to press the like button so thanks a lot for that and I'll see you next time.